I'm Dean Indira Shetty. Welcome to Godolkin University. We've trained the best and brightest young heroes since 1965. The boys came along four years ago in the awake of Avengers Endgame and felt like a breath of fresh air in the superhero space at the time as the MCU was still considered pretty solid. But if the MCU is family friendly, then the boys is the dirty magazines that your dad keeps hidden from the family. Introducing a world of superheroes ran by a large multinational company manipulating their image for profit and those who oppose them. The Boys is a show that you'll either love it for a lot of reasons or hate it just for probably the gore. But in a world where comic book movies have dominated cinema and the pop culture, this was an unexpected turn. So if you haven't guessed, I'm talking about The Boys Gen V episodes 1 to 3. As always, I'm Al, this is the Geek in Review. Before we get started, just to say thanks for taking the time to choose to watch this video, I really appreciate it and if you haven't done it already, please subscribe to the channel and hit the like button as well. So when a spin-off of The Boys was announced, I'll be honest, I was a little bit nervous, but I have to say, without any spoiler stuff at the start, this is a solid opener for Gen V. We get a familiar world that features a few familiar faces in it, and it's a great extension to The Boys, and none of the crossover stuff in these episodes feels forced at all. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But let's get to it. So episode 1 opens up with a flash of Godolkin University and it's 8 years ago with A-Train first joining the Seven. Sitwell from season 1 is back as well because it's a flashback. We live in a post-racism world. And for some people this is a pretty big deal as A-Train is the first African American on the Seven. First black man in the Seven. Hey girls, come look at this. Molly watches as he's announced and one of the daughters, Marie, goes through her first, well, you know. And this is when her powers manifest, as it turns out she can control, weaponize, or manipulate blood, killing both her parents in the process by accident due to the shock and trauma. And instantly this reminded me of the season 1 opener with Huey and his girlfriend when they first encountered A-Train. It was an absolute bloody mess and this was exactly the same and exactly what you should expect from the boys and this show. Cut to the present day and Marie is at Red River, the institute from season 3, which is the centre that handled superhero kids whose parents can't handle their abilities. We also learn there's another facility that they go to as adults if they're still unmanageable, which seems to be more like a prison. Now, one of the things I noticed in the first episode is Red River was founded the same year as Godolkin University in 1965, and you can tell that from the basketball court where Marie is using her powers. So it seems that these two institutions are probably directly linked, and this is just somewhere where they bring out the sort of best of Red River and put them into God. So Marie applies to university and gets in on a full scholarship. And then we get a quick promotional clip for God You, where we meet Dean Shetty introducing her covering topics like superhero ethics and marketing, because of course, in this world, that's super important. We get a whole bunch of name drops and meet the student who is God You's golden boy, called, well, golden boy, and his power is similar to Johnny Storm in the Fantastic Four. Marie arrives at campus complete with a Homelander statue there, and there is quite a few other statues referencing previous superheroes sprinkled throughout the episodes as well. We see a new headline about the events at Vought Tower at the end of Season 3 and what happened to Queen Maeve, before Marie meets her flatmate Emma, who can shrink and seemingly fight hamsters quite successfully. So this show is set in between Season 3 and 4 of the boys. Marie's a little bit behind being raised in the institute as she didn't have access to things like social media and the internet, so she doesn't really know how this world works or who everyone is. Oh, really? Who's David Caruso? You didn't see Jade? That's what happens when worlds collide. <laughs> but she does realise something strange that the windows on the campus don't open. And this is something else that I noticed as well, if you look at the dorm doors, they've got windows in them that are more like prison cells and heavy concrete ceilings as well. So is this just an extension of Red River? I think so. 
But Marie lies about her past, saying that her parents are still alive and that she has a brother as well. And then she gets introduced to Golden Boy, who's sort of, let's say, the human torch and seemingly plagued by nightmares, which is going to foreshadow a lot in this episode. Now, the top 10 students in the university are ranked, and it seems to be a very competitive ranking, and Marie wants to get in there. But she hasn't made all the classes that she's going to need, namely introducing to crime fighting. She goes to meet Professor Brinkerhoff, or Brink, played by Clancy Brown, and this is the guy in charge of the class, and she meets Jordan Lee as well. Jordan, right? When she first meets Jordan, she's the woman behind the desk who, after Brinkerhoff shoots her, turns into the man behind the desk. What the fuck? So that's her ability, or that's their ability. Now, they don't really go into details exactly how this works. If you notice that every time Jordan is attacked, that's when they change sex. So, I've got a few theories on this, and I'm going to talk about it at the end of the video. Marie pleads to get into his class, but Brink says she's more suited to perform in arts, and could end up on a show like Dancing with the Stars, which focuses on the huge celebrity culture that soups have in this world. On her first night, Marie sees a student escaping, screaming that he won't go back to the woods, before he's restrained by another superhero called Andre, who's also at God View, and they use a gas mask to knock this guy out, just like they did with Soldier Boy in Season 3. We find out that Andre is the son of a previous soup called Polarity, and Andre's abilities are pretty much Magneto. But Marie is having trouble fitting in as she doesn't actually seem to be aware of how the culture of superheroes work within the university or within America as a whole in this world. So fucking crazy. You didn't film it. And I had other stuff on my mind. We get another scene of Brink talking with Golden Boy about how he's going to get set up to be the next member of the Seven and how they're going to build him a fireproof suit because every time he uses his ability he ends up being naked. So this guy has been groomed for a place in the Seven for quite a while. Marie gets invited to join him on a night out along with another student called Kate who can influence people by touch, and Andre who I mentioned is a second generation soup who's got the power of magnetism. They all head into town along with Golden Boy to party on the roof of the Seventh Tower, and we get a bit more backstory on Marie. She lies and says that her parents are still alive to Golden Boy and then tells him the truth that they're dead. He says his brother died too, but he doesn't mention if it's related to his powers or Back at the university, Emma's taking a guy home who wants to use her shrinking powers for well. If you've seen the boys, you know, I can't show the clip, but you know, there's a lot of this stuff that I can't show you people. All I'm saying is leave a like. But we find out there's a catch to her ability. In order for Emma to shrink and reduce her mass, she has to vomit. So they're sending a pretty clear message here on eating disorders and how it affects young people. And also the impact of social media as well, because Emma seems to be a moderately successful YouTuber. And you see her looking at the negative comments and thinking about it here. And this show is going hard and it's not even started. Marie's still partying with Golden Boy and the rest of the gang and gets offered drugs by Andre, which she isn't sure about, but as Kate points out, she can influence her to do whatever she wants, so she tries to take them herself, before, in typical boys fashion, something goes wrong and a civilian in the club is killed when Andre's trying to impress her. Marie steps in and saves her by controlling her blood and moving it back into her body, which was actually pretty cool and a great aspect to her ability when you think about it. So she saved someone's life and the soup's image, so she's on the way up the ladder of getting the attention that she wanted. But it's not exactly the attention that she does want. Professor Brink calls her into his office the next day and forces her to take the rap for the accident, kicking her out of the university in typical Vought business style. See, Golden Boy, Andre, Jordan, they're going all the way. They could save thousands of people. Traumatised by what's been going on, Golden Boy wakes up from a dream hearing a voice asking him where he is. Where are you? He hears a guy called Sam who says he's in the woods, so that's the guy that escaped earlier on in the episode. And after the voice dissipates, Golden Boy goes to see Brink to confront him about it, and Marie walks in on them just as Golden Boy is killing Brink. He tries to explain that Brink is no good experimenting on students and tries to convince her to help him cover it up, and it's all a little bit Homelander here when he's in denial, before he decides it's probably easy just to get rid of her as well. Chasing her through the campus, they run into Jordan who confronts Golden Boy and they start fighting before it spills out into the rest of the building. 
And Golden Boy is very, very Homelander from this point during the attack. At least that's what I think. With things not going his way, he whispers something to Andre before taking off into the sky, Human Torch style, and exploding. So who saw that coming? They kill off one of their main characters in the first episode. And it's supposed to be the main soup of the series. At least that's how the marketing made it look. Also, man, yeah, I was really shocked by this. What did you guys think about when Golden Boy exploded at the end of episode one? Let me know. So episode two opens up with a cover of Metallica, Nothing Else Matters, with the Golden Boy cleanup going on and Marie reflecting on her start at God You. Vought and Godu are working on keeping the cover story and focus on Marie as the shining new star now that she's saved the day. Classic superhero story. Marie Moreau was there too. How'd she do in the... Ashley confronts Dean Shetty and asks if the woods were part of what happened to Luke and doesn't want whatever's going on exposed. Emma tries to take her mind off of what's happened as she blames herself and it's not even her first full day yet. But the spin is that Marie saved the day, not Jordan, so her antics have made her something of a star on campus, and she's already in the top 10 students and hasn't done much. Andre is now the new number one, with Jordan being number five, and you can tell this is going to be an ongoing thing throughout the season. It's also a great way to pit the students against each other. But Marie is definitely the standout at the moment, getting all the attention and benefits that come from her own social media manager named Jeff that's assigned to bring her up to Still speed. Brand awareness and social mentions. You fucking own Twitter right now. Hashtag Black Girl Magic. Andre and his dad, who I mentioned earlier on, was an older superhero called Polarity, are also working on his image, trying to get him to be and stay on the number one slot. And he really wants Andre to replace him as the new polarity. But I think Andre's dad is very interesting because he wasn't part of the Seven and also he doesn't really seem to be able to use his powers anymore or he hasn't used his powers yet. So I wonder what happened to this guy that he's no longer wearing a suit. But Andre doesn't seem that keen to be following in his dad's footsteps. Everyone else at the university is trying to get back to normal after the death of Luke. Dean Shetty is taking over Brink's classes and Jordan's pissed that Marie's getting the credit from them. Apparently, we find out that the whole non-binary or gender fluid thing isn't going to sell well in Florida. So basically, no matter what Jordan does, they're never going to be marketable or profitable for Vaughn. They want Marie to tell the truth when she gets interviewed about this whole thing that's getting lined up later on in the day, but of course has already been given a copy of the script of what to say by the Vought officials. And the Vought PR machine is in full effect, painting Luke as some psychopathic, drug-addled serial killer. Emma confesses to another girl on campus, Justine, whose powers that we haven't seen yet, that she has to purge in order to reduce mass to shrink, and she hates herself for doing it. So this show is really going deep, as I mentioned earlier on, on the pressures of fame, social media and young people. Justine later exposes Emma's secret for social media clout, so she's not above ruining a friendship to further her own self. But yeah, with Justine's ability, I kind of wonder if she's got the ability to make people confess, because we see a sort of few hints of that throughout these episodes, but they don't specifically say what Justine's power is. But what do you guys think? What is Justine's power? Let me know in the comments below. Dean Shetty decides to have a chat with Marie before the interview, talking about her powers and how it's affected her. Asking her why she wants to be a hero, Marie says it's to find her sister, who's also been adopted, but as she didn't have powers, she was taken somewhere else when they were younger and they were split up. Later on, we see Shetty go to the lower levels of the campus, where they seem to be experimenting on superheroes, just as Luke said. But to what end, I wonder? We see Sam, who's the guy that escaped in episode one, and they seem to be doing some sort of experimentation on him, but it's not clear exactly what it is. Meanwhile, Andre and Kate are beginning to realise about the Golden Boy Vault cover-up. Andre and Kate are beginning to realise about the Vault Golden Boy cover-up, and Andre realises what Golden Boy's last words were and what they meant, and that he's hidden a mobile phone in Homelander's statue's crotch, because it's the boys! They find a message in the phone with Golden Boy warning them that God, you, has his brother, so he's not dead after all. Luke just kind of believed this, or at least partially believed it and spun it. So it's his brother that they've been experimenting on all the time. Marie's getting ready for an interview and debates telling the truth about Jordan being involved in the Golden Boy fight. 
And at the same time, Andre breaks into Brink's office to get more information and finds files on the woods and Sam as well. He gets interrupted, but he manages to hide and get out. But Andre was supposed to be part of the interview as well, so he's stuck missing it, pissing off his dad as Brink's laptop is taken as part of the cover-up. Marie is about to go on air without Andre when the presenter mentions to her that they'd contacted her sister and that she didn't want to be a part of it. So Marie's ideals of a happy reunion are struck down, but she does toe the vault line and sticks to the script, but you can tell that this really does affect her. Andre follows the guys that took the laptop and watches them murder a janitor as they disappear into a secret passageway in the university. So there seems to be a lot going on here that the general public aren't aware of. We do see a missing poster for the janitor in the next episode, but yeah, I wonder how many times they're doing this to employees. But he gets discovered and they have a device that can neutralise superheroes as they have a higher spectrum of hearing than normal people. But before Andre can get taken away, Kate shows up and saves him, distracting the guards and pushes, well, I can't say what she pushes and I can't show either, but it was absolutely hysterical. But every time that Kate uses her powers, it diminishes her strength a little bit, she collapses from pushing too much. And that's where episode two ends. Episode three opens up to a flashback three years ago of Luke and Kate who are trying to help his brother Sam, freaking out after finding out he's been dosed with V as a kid, and which seems to really affect them mentally. And this is the same facility that we've seen in The Boys Season 2 as well. Basically, he just wants to be normal and he seems very self-destructive and he's got a lot of issues. He kills a guard that tries to subdue him and throws Golden Boy about and it's Kate that actually manages to stop him and convince him to stay in the Institute. So she feels very responsible for what's going to happen to Sam. Cut to the present, Kate wakes up in her room after overdoing it. Andre shows her the evidence that Sam's still alive and wants to free him, so you can imagine exactly how she's feeling. While this is going on, Marie's in her dorm and realises that she's not alone. Emma's there and she's shrunken down and she needs food to put back on mass. So it goes both ways, so she has to vomit to reduce mass and then binge it to put it back on. And I absolutely love this, I mean I know it's a very sensitive topic, but the way that they've handled it in this show and fitted it in with the superpowers and Emma is absolutely brilliant and that's why I love the boys, as they're not afraid to go to these places. So Marie obviously realises how dangerous Emma's powers are to her and Emma makes a good point that Marie has to cut herself in order to manipulate her own blood. So again, they're talking about some very dark issues here and presenting them in a way that these people have to confront them if they want to use their powers. And I really hope that they continue this throughout the season. The next day, Marie has breakfast with Dean Shetty and we find out that she had a daughter and she really seems to want to get Marie on side. Even saying that she knows that the interviewer probably lied about her sister just to get some sort of emotion out of her before they recorded. Now the main plot point of episode 3 is the memorial fundraiser for Professor Brink and this is this big social occasion that all the students and all the faculty are going to be there for to try and raise money for the university. Andre's dad is pissed about Marie's sudden rise and that Andre missed a big interview. Justine apologises to Emma about using her story to get views but as it's being filmed it doesn't really seem too genuine and we're still not really getting any more story in Justine. So I think she's probably going to play a major role in the season or just kind of hiding her in plain sight at the moment. Emma's mum shows up for the big night and we find out straight away she knows about Emma's abilities and has kind of helped her perfect the best way to do it, which, yeah, yeah. Jordan's still pissed at Marie for taking credit for stopping Golden Boy, as their parents arrive for a visit as well. So everyone's at the campus for the big night. But we see at the sort of other levels that the soups have to work on here behind the scenes, obviously parallel in show business. And Emma's secret is also up for a market and exploit by Vought, when she's offered her own reality TV show and we find out that her mum is the one who's engineered all this and is the mastermind behind her abilities, effectively creating her eating disorder. And we've seen this happen before in The Boys where parents have exploited their children for their own benefit financially and in order to try and live through them. And yeah, none of the parents in this show particularly come off well. Jordan is facing a similar situation with their parents who always want them to be male as that's how they were born. And these two characters, they're doing something very important and relevant with Jordan through this scene as well. 
And it seems to be that these children, no matter what they do, are always fighting for acceptance from their parents, apart from Marie, who doesn't have parents. Andre meets Emma and fills her in on what's going on with Sam in the woods, and he wants her to use her powers to investigate further. So she shrinks down and she manages to find Sam, but he also finds her and traps her, asking if she's real. He thinks he's manifested her and she convinces him she's real, but doesn't want to leave. He thinks that he manifested her and tries to quiz her and she convinces him that she is actually real, but he doesn't want to seem to leave as every time he tries, people get hurt. But he doesn't know about his brother yet, so she convinces him that Luke sent him in order to get him out. And they kind of bond here, and you can see that they might be setting something up down the road. And I have to say, I like it. There's a bit of tension between these two. But all in all, not a great night for everyone. Andre tries to tell his dad about what's going on at university, but he warns him not to tell anyone, so he seems to know about what's going on in the woods. Whether he's involved in it or not, we don't know yet. Marie confesses a real past to Jordan and Kate. Kate tells her that every soup's got a similar story and how it affected their family and you find out that Kate is kind of responsible for killing her brother by telling him to disappear into the woods. Emma gets discovered and has to leave Sam behind but she attacks a guard after he's knocked out. Emma gets discovered and has to leave Sam behind after he's electrocuted. She attacks a guard and goes in through his ear hole to kill him and comes out the other side. And in typical boys fashion, of course, this is what we're going to get. It's exactly what I expected from this show. And again, it is callbacks to the main show with Huey always getting covered in blood as well. And that's how the episode ends with her coming out the guy's ear and more guards coming into the cell. And as I said at the start, I'll be honest, I'd seen all the trailers for this and didn't think that this show was for me. But man, it hits really hard. The feelings that they're developing here with social media, body image and the pressure from the outside on young people is really well done and so well crafted. None of it is played for humour or being exploited in any sort of way, and they're really trying to get a big message across here. They've been really smart about the message and points that they're trying to make, and I can see them building on this in a really interesting way. So far, I like all the characters and what they're doing with their backstories. I've just got a few questions about what's going on and how certain things work. I do think that Justine is probably going to be more key than we realise. I mean, could she actually be Dean Shetty's daughter? I don't know. I'm sure like everyone, you were all shocked when Golden Boy aka Luke died at the end of episode 1, but it looks as if we're going to be getting flashbacks with him throughout the season. But all in all, I thought this was an absolutely solid opener for a spin-off show, and it didn't feel like it tied too much or relied on the boys, it just felt like it fitted into this world perfectly. But this is just what I think, I'm going to be doing more videos on Gen V and the boys as well, so make sure you're subscribed and you've got the notifications turned on so you don't miss it, and as always, if you've made it this far, leave a like on the video as well. But I want to hear what you guys think, did you watch the first three episodes of Gen V? Did you like it, did you not like it? Let me know in the comments below, or you can reach out to me on Twitter, or X or whatever you want to call it at the Geeks Reviews. As always, my name's Al. Thanks for watching.